now have to answer that question uh, as to you know whose name you know Peter and John ministered to this lame man uh, in. So Peter and John, they are bold enough. Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, answers their question and tells them that they did it in the name of Jesus. So next, what happens? From verse 13. Uh, I hope uh, you're able to track with me. I, uh, I'm reading some of these scriptures, um, you know, so that it, it'll be easier for you to understand. If I just narrate the story, you might miss out on some keywords there and all. But I, I hope it's not uh, confusing. Is it okay? Okay. All right. So the best thing uh, to do is to have the Bible open in front of you as I talk and look at the Bible. That that is what is going to, uh, you know, be the best way. Uh, but if you are just listening, I think that also should be fine because I'm reading out some of the scriptures here. Uh, so yes, I am at uh, verse thirteen of Acts chapter four. So you can imagine the scene with me. Here are these uh, leaders, and they are like they are just you know blown away by the answer of Peter and John. They would have wanted them to uh, you know be cowardly and uh, try to uh, you know cover up some matters and you know come across as really fearful, but they were bold enough, and they they said. They ministered in the name of Jesus. So when the authorities observed this, scriptures say, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and you see how they are able to process it. These guys are so bold. How could they be so bold? And you know, Luke goes on to uh, write, and perceive that they were uneducated and untrained men. Okay, standing up in front of a learned audience, boldness comes when you have done this many times before. You know, you've been trained, you probably educated, but these guys had none of that, and the panel knew it. So they they knew that the, the caliber of these men is they are untrained, they are uneducated. So what is the reason? They marveled, it says. They looked at them and they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So you see, they're already witnesses of the, the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And they knew you know, what kind of a man he was. And looking at Peter and John and their boldness, they were immediately able to make the connection. They say, oh, you know, it's that clan, Jesus' tribe. Jesus' team. So they are just like Jesus. They had been with Jesus. And that boldness rubs off on his disciples. Wow, what a what a wonderful testimony, isn't it? That somebody looks at us and they look at our uh, you know life, they hear our testimony, they hear what we have to say, and they are marveled. They say, How come, you know, how come this person uh, has this wisdom or uh, has this boldness? And they come to the conclusion they had been with Jesus. Okay, so uh, it really challenges us in our walk with the Lord. And you know, let's pray that we can be witnesses of this kind, where people will immediately know that these people have been with Jesus. Okay, verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. See, I've been saying that. The miracle speaks for itself in many ways. So how can the authorities do you know any further? They are interrogating, intimidating, all that they're trying, their tactics. But there is nothing solid you know, that they, they can uh, convict these men with. What will they convict them with? Peter also said, we did a good deed. You know, this man is able to walk now. What are you saying? Is, is that why we are under trial? So the authorities knew all this. 
that they really had no grasp on uh, you know any solid point so now what to do they're stuck the authorities are stuck we can't do anything uh, so then finally what conclusion can they come to was 15 but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council they conferred among themselves okay this is panic mode crisis mode they may be uh, influential people but they conferred together so you can imagine okay, you can imagine here's the room uh, and the whole uh, the trial is going on and the authorities feel stuck so they tell peter and john can you go out for a few minutes we have to talk and then you can see when this uh peter and john have gone out they're like okay now what to do you know what is the best thing to do so they, they're having like a conversation among themselves to manage the situation so they conferred among themselves saying what shall we do to these men for indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident. So they are affirming. It's a real miracle. To all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. How real is it? Everybody in Jerusalem knows this man. And now they can see he's walking. We can't do anything. Okay, It's out of our hand. Next. 17. But so that it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them. That from now on, they speak to no man in this name. So, this is the best they could do. They were like, we have no proper evidence. Uh, our, you know, uh, tactics of intimidation is not working on these men. Okay, let's do this. Let us threaten them. Okay? Uh, and we will instruct them. We will tell them. You should never again speak in this name. Okay. You do what you want, but we don't want to find you anywhere speaking in the name of Jesus. So they thought this is the best solution for now. We'll see how it goes. Okay. So they came to this conclusion. What happens next? They call them in. And they commanded them not to speak at all not teach in the name of jesus they say okay we will be at peace with you whatever you are doing as disciples you do it but don't take the name of this man jesus okay that's what they told them the disciples can the disciples obey now what do we do when the authorities tell us not to um you know, fulfill the Great Commission, talk in the name of Jesus. What do we do when we encounter such situations? Let's see the example of Peter and John. Peter and John, verse 19, they say, they answer them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So, obviously, they are not succumbing to the pressure. And uh, they are not willing to give up and say that, okay, fine, we will stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Oh, we are so scared. What will happen to us? No, but they knew that the God they served is greater. Just like Jesus. It's like they tried to contain one Jesus, but now you have many others just like Jesus and they're not able to control what's going on. Um, and the boldness remains. So Peter and John, they say, we are sorry. We cannot do what you are asking us to do. We have to stand up for what we believe. We are witnesses of the Lord Jesus. So they counter question them. Okay, You have asked us all these questions and now you are commanding us not to preach in the name of Jesus. Here is our counter question. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. You decide. How can... This is the same God you claim to worship. And we are following that God. And you're asking us to stop. So uh, it's it's not fair. You know that, That's the point they were trying to make. So verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they are simply saying, 
we will be witnesses you can't stop it whatever we know till now whatever we have seen till now we are going to continue to share it and you can't stop us okay so they uh, don't you know uh, come under the pressure so at times when authorities ask us to do things which will make us go against what god has spoken right uh, or le let me put it this way against worshiping god yes there are some a few things which you know if if uh, we are told okay don't worship in this space or uh, don't make too much noise or don't fine you know these are the understandable very reasonable requests we can follow those things but if it comes to a place where like in the case of uh, daniel he's told no you need to bow down you you cannot worship your god you have to bow down to uh, at that point it was the idol of uh, nebuchadnezzar he says no i'm sorry i can't do it so right now the disciples are doing the same thing they're saying we cannot but speak of the things which we have heard and we have seen so we will continue to be witnesses so they tell them boldly and verse 18 okay we've already done verse 18 verse 21 so when they had further threatened them so further threatened means it's been a hard time for peter and john they have been threatened earlier they have been uh, threatened prior to this so you know they uh continue to face uh, uh opposition right uh, through this entire trial uh, and the authorities are clearly instructing them they're commanding them don't speak just don't speak in the name of jesus uh, and they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people since they all glorified god for what had been done i know that your uh, batch has completed the uh, course on keys to supernatural ministry and how over there we said why is the supernatural important because it turns the hearts of the people towards god so notice here even the authorities recognized that the people are glorifying god because of what had happened so when miracles take place when supernatural things take place what is the outcome of that glory to god so we must pray and ask God you know, that all these things happen uh, in our midst today. So they are commanded, they are threatened, uh, and they are let go. Okay, so uh, yes, again, there's that explanation that you know, it was a notable miracle for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Okay, now let's see what kind of reaction peter and john would have something has completely changed in the dynamics they are so bold compared to the times uh, of the trial of jesus so peter and john they are let go they went to their own companions again it's so beautiful see when we are going through uh, a time of persecution, a time of opposition. These are all not things that we can face alone. Okay, so thank God because the word of God talks about the church, it talks about community, it talks about koinonia, the fellowship of believers. And Peter and John had such a fellowship. So they go back, it says, to their own companions. These are the believers. They are the believers who were in the upper room. They are the believers, uh, you know, who accepted uh, Christ on the day of uh, Pentecost. And we don't know, right? Uh, as the ministry is going on, we are only hearing about the ministry of Peter and John. There were other apostles. There were other believers. They would have gone and spoken to, uh, you know, uh, people. So there could be others as well we don't know how many people are believing and how many people are joining the uh, church of jerusalem how many are on their own worshiping the lord but the message is spreading 
okay, in Jerusalem. These folks, Peter and John, have their own companions. So they have that, that gathering that you know I was uh, mentioning about. So those 3,000 people plus 120 at least. So they come back to uh, some of these people. They come back, the companions, and do what? They shared. They unburdened their hearts. They told them, they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. It would have been a painful experience, but thank God there was the fellowship of the believers. They came back and they were able to share. They were able to report. Look, all this has happened. Okay. Why? Why would do you think it would have been helpful to share? For several reasons. One is uh, they would have found comfort in, in uh, those companions, they would have uh, uh, you know, just been able to release the, if at all, there was fear, anxiety, whatever uh, they were carrying. And they could rely on the prayers of the others. Okay, So while there are some in the forefront facing the fire, there are others in the background upholding you know these men in prayer and they are also battling in the spiritual realm uh, when when times of uh, opposition come when times of persecution come so that is the beauty of this so they go back to their own companions and they report they report that so we can expect you know, probably this companion this group of uh, uh, believers uh, will get scared They'll be disturbed and uh, they might come to the conclusion that, uh, or they might try to convince Peter and John, what have you done? You should have just said, okay, we will no longer preach in the name of Jesus. No, hush, hush. We'll, we'll preach in some places where they don't notice us. So they could have given such advice also, but that was not the case. Verse 24, what happens? When they heard that, they heard the report, they raised, they raised us, all these people, the fellowship of believers, including Peter and John, it says, raised their voice to God. So prayer is rising up. So in moments of great opposition, there is a need for prayer. And even prayer in groups and communities, it says, they raise their voice isn't that interesting they raise their voices it it's that would probably be like acts too when they were all gathered and they were all praying together okay uh, so there would have been uh, i mean there was a sound and uh, people gathered because of this. lots of voices but in this case acts 4 they raised their voice, one voice. Okay, so one voice we can understand it in several ways. You know, maybe one person prayed aloud, but the hearts of the others was very much in line with that one person, and so the voice of that one person is the voice of every person gathered in that meeting. So it just goes to say there was unity of heart. Remember, we said that was one of the beautiful features of the early church, the oneness, the, uh, you know, the uh, unity of their hearts. And you see that even at a time like this in difficulty. So they have one voice to God or together they are asking God, you know, the same things. It's not like some believers have a few points which are pulling in the opposite direction of the points of other believers. No, unity of thought, unity of mind, unity of heart. So they cry out to God. And it also adds, as if one voice was not enough, you know, Luke adds, he says, with one accord, one voice to God and with one accord. That's a beautiful fellowship, oneness of heart. They call out to God. Okay, so what could their prayer be now? Let's see. Uh, they are saying so whoever prayed on their behalf lord you are god who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them so they are beginning by affirming the nature of god the capacity of god the greatness of god the majesty of god so 
no they just getting perspective what we are going through is nothing in the face of eternity that god has created we worship the god who has created the heavens and the earth and they are affirming that and uh, by the mouth of your servant david have said the quoting from psalm 2 why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the lord and against his christ so the opposition reminds them of what the psalmist wrote why did the nations rage so why did opposition rise up against who not as again they are not saying that at least in the beginning they're not saying that we have encountered opposition but the context uh, here in is uh this is a plot against you oh god against the christ okay uh, so just give me a moment here i would like to um, pause uh and also just reconnect my system here it's sort of losing uh, the power so i'll just reconnect it and be back with you in a moment Okay, my apologies. Uh, let's go back. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, they did not take the opposition as just opposition that came against them, but they understood that this was a spiritual opposition. Just the way the um, opposition came against Jesus today, when they are ministering in the name of Jesus, they are also facing. opposition and remember jesus said that when he taught his people he said uh, if they do not spare you know the the uh, leader the master how will they spare the followers so it was happening everything that jesus talked about was actually uh, beginning to manifest in the lives of his followers so <clears throat> let's go forward verse 27 But truly against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done okay so basically they're stating facts whatever happened uh, uh, in the life of Jesus his trial but they also say that god you know your purposes were accomplished anyway no matter what man tries to do god is powerful enough uh, to accomplish his own purposes and verse 29 knowing all this knowing you know that uh, god is mighty knowing that uh, this kind of opposition had come against christ and as followers of christ we facing the same thing jesus went through it they're asking for god's intervention what do they ask for are they asking god protect us god uh, put us in a new city or harm the rulers and sometimes we hear prayers like that okay uh, yes be led by the holy spirit we are not saying every time somebody is in uh, facing persecution you have to pray only like this no you pray as the holy spirit leads you but uh, this prayer is very encouraging to us because what they ask verse 29 they say now lord look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word so so as boldness throughout this passage filled with the holy spirit peter says you know to them and now again in prayer in unity they are telling god god whatever boldness we had till now let it continue and give us lord give us all boldness they say that you give us 
meaning the uh, apostles in this case because at that point uh, they were the the you know primary leaders of the church so they were the ones who would uh, steer things for all the believers so they're asking the people are also praying for these apostles and in this case more specifically peter and john and they're saying god give them the boldness give them that they may speak your word nobody can stop you know, the word of the living God of heaven and earth. Let nothing intimidate us. Help us to keep doing what you have called us to do. Okay. Uh, so I'm just reminded at this point, there are many stories that we can talk about, but I'm reminded of uh, the story of Richard Wormbrin, those of you who have read, uh, and I probably have quoted uh, you know, talked about him earlier uh, in God's Underground. Uh, it's a story of a Christian who was uh, put in the communist prison for his faith. But uh, it's it's beautiful because once he got saved, he developed the habit of memorizing scripture. Uh, and in the prison, you know, he was so moved by the power of God or, or the spirit of God to continue to share Christ. And you see how difficult it is to, to share Christ in the prison. You're in your own cell. How can you even, you know, uh, talk about Jesus to someone else? But the beauty was he had scriptures inside him. So in the prison, you know, they say Morse code and uh, some such uh, things where you can communicate, uh, you know, with tapping. So he would do things like that to share the gospel. Can you imagine? You don't expect somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, persecuted, being persecuted, to be bold enough to continue sharing the gospel. But somehow we see when people are standing up for Christ, you know, uh, in, in the right way, sincerely, and opposition comes, nothing. Nothing can intimidate. Nothing can stop the work of God. And the book of Acts is a great example of how persecution, it's just starting, by the way. As we go into the uh, you know coming chapters, there'll be more persecution. That'll be pretty scary stuff. But did that stop the gospel? No. Did that uh, stop? the uh, saving of souls and people being added to the kingdom of God? No. It only multiplied. It continues to multiply. So that thing can stop the purpose of God. And that's what they prayed also in this prayer. They said, God, we are not afraid. They tried to crucify you. They tried to stop your process. But, you know, yeah, they tried to stop uh, uh, your purpose, but nothing stopped Jesus. Your purpose was anyway fulfilled. Even through us, your purpose will be fulfilled. Okay, so what do they ask for? They say, God, uh, you know all the threats. Grant us all boldness, especially the leaders, so that they may speak your word. Can we pray like this for uh, people we know? who are facing persecution right now, yes, we can pray for our brothers and sisters and say, God, you give them your word, boldness to speak your word in the very circumstances where they are at. Second thing which they are asking, verse 30, they are saying, by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay, again, marvelous. One miracle which took place, you are in trouble. We're already in trial, Peter and John. But what are the people asking for? They're saying, God, do more. Hello, wasn't this enough? We've already faced the, the fire. No, because they also had this boldness that nobody can stop God. Let them try. Let them try all they want. We have a mandate. We are witnesses with power for the gospel we are witnesses with power you know uh, about the resurrection of christ so let them do what they want to do we've got to do what we've got to do 
right? So they are bored. They are asking for uh, to for the word to go out and the miracles to be continued among their midst. So how does God respond? You know, when we pray, sometimes there are physical manifestations where we can say, you know, I felt peace. I felt uh, uh, the warmth of God on my body. I felt like a cool breeze. You know, I, something like that. We something tangible that we can point to and say, "I know God answered my prayer." Not always, though. We we don't have such uh, things happening all the time. In this time, when the believers prayed, something tangible took place. Verse thirty-one. It says. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So somehow, you know, God uh, thought it fit to give them these physical manifestations of His presence. Earlier, we said a sound from heaven, rushing mighty wind. So it was evident, hey, God is here. God is ministering to you guys. Again, when they are in this place, physically, right, the place where they were was shaken. Uh, some translations, you know, they, they kind of point to an earthquake. So an earthquake took place. As if to tell them, I heard your prayer. Okay, so don't ask me why earthquake, why not uh, rain. I have no idea. God just wanted uh, a way in which He wanted to show that I'm with you, and I've heard your prayer. So an earthquake took place at that time, like not like a you know destroying earthquake, but just like a shaking, where uh, th th there's some sort of a comfort to their hearts that yes, the God of heaven and earth has is with us. And uh, the next thing it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So their prayer is answered in a in a way. Right at that moment, they are speaking God's word with boldness. Um, they don't. It doesn't feel like you know they lost uh, their uh, mandate or their agenda or their great commission despite the opposition. And one more thing that I want us to note is they were filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So notice, baptism in the Holy Spirit for the first time happened on the day of Pentecost. So we also stated being born again is a separate experience from being uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And all believers in the book of Acts, you will see, first they accept Christ, next they will be led into baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Once. Okay, so once it happens, but that is just the beginning. Have you noticed with me, Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit, they prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So baptism with the Holy Spirit, the initiation of it is, you could say, yes, I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit. That speaks of that first experience, which you've had, I've had, but that's not all. There can be multiple and repeated fillings in the Holy Spirit, you know, which you and I can have. So don't stop at the day of Pentecost. Time and again, day in and day out, no wonder Paul later wrote, he said, you know, walk in the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, okay? Bear the fruit of the Spirit. So we can have these multiple fillings of the Holy Spirit resulting in what? Resulting in, as we've seen, boldness, signs, miracles, wonders, wisdom of God, the fruit, the nature of God you know, being seen through us like Jesus, becoming more like Jesus. So uh, uh, the, the point I'm making is we have to desire filling of the Holy Spirit. Don't be satisfied. Oh, on the first time when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, I was spoken tongues like this and this happened, that happened. Wonderful. That was just the beginning. So we need to continually be filled in the Holy Spirit. And that is what we see in the lives of um, the, the apostles and believers. 
the book of acts and want to invite you to that continually be filled be filled how is it possible to be filled filled all the time you know there are so many people and multiple fillings of the holy spirit won't won't uh, uh, holy spirit god be exhausted no we're talking about the infinite god in the old testament we read about him, the everlasting god he is infinite to infinity and the holy spirit uh, i'm not sure if i gave you that uh, analogy but if you look at an ocean when you take a drop you can't deplete the ocean okay all of us take drops you just can't deplete the ocean it's that big so in the same way we can keep receiving keep receiving we put the limit on god okay? so desire desire multiple infillings of the holy spirit and it will produce all of what we have seen and you know the, the spirit of god uh, we can't box him up there are so many other things that we can do uh, in and through our lives as well but just be open to the feelings of the holy spirit okay let's move on verse 32 it's talking about the community of believers what a beautiful community that uh, in a troubled time they could support one another they could pray with one another beautiful isn't it uh, also i don't want us to get stuck in the acts community it's, it's always you know take the good leave the bad okay so uh, is this a loving fellowship is this a beautiful fellowship uh, is, is it a, a fellowship that uh, uh, you know reveals god to the world very true but you see there are people at the end of the day there is flaw in every community so we will begin to see and talk about the flaws which this early church community also had but at this point what is being described is all positive it's all great so thank god for that verse 32. now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own but they had all things in common right so going back to acts 2 We've already talked about the context. We've already talked about the fact that it's a growing church, you know, a growing set of leaders. They're making decisions for the church. They're establishing the organization. They are, uh, you know, planning the, the resources, the finances. All that is happening. It's a growing church. Just took birth recently. So that is the reason why all the sharing was necessary. So what are we told here? Anyone? Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they they had all things in common. Okay, so what does it show? Very selfless. Okay, very selfless. Uh, they were caring about each other. Verse thirty-two. They were caring. They were united. Verse thirty-three. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Okay. Features, features of the church, unity, uh, sacrificial love, you, you may call it. Third one, supernatural. Supernatural to the extent, right, that uh, they're able to give witness for Christ. So if we can imagine a local church in a city or in, uh, in a particular uh, place, would look at them and say, oh, these people are all so, so so loving. You know, they love one another. We can observe that. They're united. And you could also say that there's something supernatural going on there. Whatever they do, you can see the power of God. For such was their witness. Great grace was upon them. And here, uh, I told us, the leadership is evolving. So currently, the apostles are in the... Uh, you know, in, in the center. So the apostles, the great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Maybe they had more opportunities than the others, but uh, they were able to demonstrate the supernatural. Okay, then verse 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. Okay, so again, 
that uh, selfless way of giving is continuing. Uh, uh, people are even selling what they have and giving to those who don't have. So you see there that nobody is lacking. Okay, nobody is lacking. In Psalm 132, God promises, He says, My house, you know, Zion, uh, the church is called as Zion there, uh, that provision will be in Zion. At this time, you can see the fulfillment of that. Nobody lacked anything, Luke writes. So there was provision for all the believers. And let's remember, it was all voluntary. You don't really see that, uh, you know, the apostles are telling people, you have to do like this, you have to sell the things. No, it was all voluntary. And I think... Uh, Sister Rupa pointed it out also in our earlier class. So it was voluntary. And verse 35, so they sold all the things. And what are they doing? Laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. So voluntarily, they are bringing the resources to the apostles. So there is a system. Okay, uh, Somehow it, it seems like that that they would give the resources to the apostles. Uh, the leadership would make decisions on how, where, when these resources need to be sent. So, But at the end of the day, nobody is lacking anything. As 36, okay, we have the introduction of a notable personality who will later on become uh, quite popular in the Book of Acts. So Joseph. Okay, who was also named Barnabas, Barnabas by the apostles. So what is the meaning of his name? Barnabas means son of encouragement. A Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we are told about this good man who was a Levite. So he comes from a, a good clan as well. He's wealthy. So again, think about the nature of the Church of Jerusalem. There are poor people. There are also very rich people. Okay, So some have uh, enough. And they are able to sell it and give to the others. There are poor, but they are receiving. So there's humility on both sides. You know, that you need humility to give. You need humility to even receive. So it's a very humble church. They are caring for each other. So in this manner, um, possessions are uh, being supplied okay and it's a, a voluntary act where uh, people are not being forced joyfully they're making this decision so let me just uh, pause here we uh, completed acts chapter 4 we can come back and pick up from acts chapter 5 uh, at this point if there are uh, you know things that you wanted to ask you could please do that or just share your thoughts, anything that touched you, anything you found interesting in our discussion so far. So it could only mean two things. You're, you know, there's uh, something that you've grasped, which you're wondering about, or you know, or you're completely blank, have nothing to wonder. Hi, Pastor. Yes. Hi. Hi, Taisha. No, I am clear. Thank you. Okay. It is very, That's nice. very um, enlightening how the apostles that they thought about honorable man pretty much just paraphrasing in my word men of integrity um set aside to look about the widows to care about um dealing about food but they did not stop per it was essential but at the same time they were not distracted by the needs and the needs of the people were the same and and when you look at it today 
how people sometimes become so selfish. Oh, it's my, my, my. It's, it's uh, you know, it's all about me, my money, my this. And they don't remember that. It's the Almighty God that gives you the power to get wealth, as he says in Deuteronomy, right? And you forget. He gives you the wisdom, knowledge, and the strength to work it. But yet still, you cannot share with somebody. I was sharing with somebody, and it brought me to, to this scripture came back to me, Acts. And... um. It's not the first, I've done the studies on it, but um, it came back to me and always stood out um, like a sore thumb, so to speak, um, that the person said to me, it's not my fault people are poor. I don't see why I should give them my money. And it really struck me. I'm like, wow, why, why would you think that way? You know, people... There will the Bible said there always be the poor and they they it's not that you're saying you're um should squander your money, but some they generally need help. And to see the need that we should help wherever we can. Um in the book of Acts, these are exemplary men, you know, doing this work and still um in per right and taking care of the church and the widows and looking out for the little ones so to speak because whatsoever we do to the least you know um jesus they're still following jesus's plan jesus always look out he always he's always feeding people he's always looking out no matter how weary he is you saw when john the baptist um died and he went in the boat to console himself then look after he was moved by the multitude came not just one person uh, the multitude came and he fed them just the same and prayed for them he was moved by he had comp the bible said he had compassion on them so it's the same compassion we should have on god's people so i i like the book of acts and i like what it's showing us so we can still in essence practice that today do not forego it. Practice it. Just as though parsing yes. is important, just like when you talk about the supernatural, it is important too. But don't forget, there are needs to that needs to be met. Yes. That's my take. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you for uh, uh, sharing mm -hmm. your thoughts. And yes, it is a giving community and uh, very uh, relevant to their times. Later on, of course, I pointed out that Paul does talk about you know, taking responsibility for yourself and managing your resources yourself. But that's, you know, in that context. But right now, people, as you said, they need help. And the community was compassionate enough. And it's beautiful. Um, uh, so, oh, we've already <laughs> run out of time. Say, uh, I, I saw your hand raised and it's, you know, 10.50. So uh, if you don't mind... Uh, we could take up your question in the next class. Uh, we'll just pray and close. So uh, I want to request someone please to pray that God will continue to, uh, you know, enlighten us through the Book of Acts. Father, we thank you for the studies. We thank you that we're here to learn and apply, Father, whatever this mighty book to our lives what the exemplary um beavers of the apostles that have gone before us the forerunners of the feet father thank you so much and the work that the holy spirit has done and is still doing the wind that is blowing but i pray the same wind and the fire of pentecost will locate us i pray lord god for a mighty out pouring upon each and every one of our lives that we will be moved by compassion and not only for our own needs but the needs of the people lord for prayer for lord for physical food for encouragement for spiritual enrichment and uplifting we thank you for healing and for deliverance lord we pray that miracles and signs and wonders will follow us like god follows their apostles in the mighty name of jesus continue to pour out an apc and the administrative lord and and pastor nancy thank you lord for doing the work lord thank you so much for gearing them up in prayer for this course and this semester in jesus name amen 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 thank you thank you taisha thank you everyone
always appreciate your patient listening and I pray that uh, you know, uh, it will make a difference and that God will impart his, uh, his word into each of you. Okay, so God bless and we shall meet again uh, next week. See you then. Bye for now. All right, teacher. Bye-bye. Be blessed. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.